The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. 75 years ago, hundreds of thousands died and millions more were displaced with Britain's partition of India and Pakistan. Tonight, how that past informs the present and what the future holds for these estranged neighbors. Then, as China this week indefinitely delayed the release of GDP numbers and other economic statistics, we'll assess the economic turmoil that's in the Middle Kingdom. It's Wednesday, October 19th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Seventy-five years ago, with the stroke of a pen, Britain's partition of India and Pakistan led to one of the largest mass migration and refugee crises ever. It had devastating consequences for families, for the economies of both countries, and cut ties between regions which had shared thousands of years of history. With us now on the lasting significance of that event and the prospects for better days ahead, we welcome, in New Delhi, India, Ajay Bissaria former High Commissioner of India to Canada and who previously held that post to Pakistan as well. In London, England, Rohan Mukherjee, Assistant Professor of International Relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science and author of Ascending Order, Rising Powers and the Politics of Status in International Institutions. In Boston, Massachusetts, Aisha Jalal, the Mary Richardson Professor of History and Director of Tufts University's Center for South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies. And in Washington, D.C., Hussein Haqqani, former ambassador of Pakistan to the United States, now director for South and Central Asia at the Hudson Institute. And we are delighted to welcome the four of you to our program tonight for uh, a timely discussion about a, an important moment three quarters of a century ago. And let's start with a little background here. We're going to bring up a fact file. And get some of the history on the record here before we begin our conversation. It was in August 1947 that the British ended their 200-year reign over the Indian subcontinent, dividing it into two separate countries, India with its Hindu majority and Pakistan with its Muslim majority. The boundary between the two countries, also known as the Radcliffe Line, named after the British bureaucrat who drew the line, was officially announced on August 17, 1947. That was two days after the independence of India and Pakistan. About 15 million people were uprooted and forced to move. About 2 million people died in the violence during the migration. Today, Kashmir remains the only region of British India that has not been fully integrated into one of the two countries or gained political independence. And one more, just so people can visualize it, the so-called Radcliffe Line was the boundary demarcated between the Indian and Pakistani portions of the Punjab province to the west and Bengal Presidency in the east of British India. Today, its western side is part of the India-Pakistan border, while its eastern side serves as the Bangladesh-India border. Aisha Jalal, come on in here and tell us what the key factors were in the first place behind the partition idea. Well, I mean, uh, the common mis conception is that uh, partition was brought about because of religious differences. Um, and I would like to emphasize that uh, the reason for India's partition was the failure of the two main uh, All India political parties, the Indian National Congress uh, and the All India Muslim League, to arrive at a power sharing arrangement. Uh, and whilst um, people assume that religion was the primary factor, what is ignored uh, is the role of regions. Uh, the partition of India was effectively the partition of Punjab and Bengal. Uh, when India was partitioned, uh, there were 100 million Muslims um, uh, in, uh, at the time, uh, of which 60 million became citizens of Pakistan, both east and west, uh, separated by 1,000 miles, and 40 million were left inside India, making for the largest single Muslim minority um, in the world, uh, in a, in a, in a non-Muslim um, majority country at the time. So it was a very curious result. And I think the problem is that the presumption that religion alone brought about partition misses the regional dimension of uh, the story. Uh, and I just conclude by saying that uh, I think it's quite remarkable to continue to persist with the religious arguments when uh, India is uh, said to be, uh, uh, in 2050, become the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, so I do think there's a very peculiar um, uh, problem with the way partition is 
discussed and projected and, 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 and consumed by Messi. Well, maybe we can resolve some of that over the next half hour as we continue our discussion. Ambassador Hakani, let me get you in here at this point. Cyril Radcliffe, he was the lawyer who drew the lines on the map. He never set foot in India before doing so. Why was he put in charge of the partition plan? Well, the British assumed that a, a fair judge would be able to divide uh, the subcontinent much more fairly, and both sides agreed on him. I think that uh, Dr. Jalal's point that there were political differences between the two major political parties was a significant factor, but I think that only talks about partition the event. I would argue that there is also partition the process, and that process is still continuing. Pakistan has become more Islamist, and India has become more Hindutva-oriented. And so the political process has taken a new dimension in which basically both sides uh, have become less respectful of minorities. And as a result, the chance that there will be uh, a settlement after which both countries will live happily ever after uh, has just not materialized. The two countries have ended up uh, becoming uh, rivals forever in a way. Uh, and that is fed by the politics of each country. Pakistan inherited one third of the British Indian Army, 17% of the resources and 19% of uh, the uh, population. And as a result, the military became the most significant institution, uh, which is still continuing. And on the Indian side, uh, after the failure of the party that uh, brought about both partition and independence, the Indian National Congress, a Hindu nationalist movement has taken root, which makes the Muslims in Pakistan feel that maybe the only thing we did right was break away from India. So the two countries have become more religiously, relatively more homogenous, notwithstanding the fact that India has a much larger uh, Muslim population than Pakistan has a Hindu population now. Hi, Commissioner Basaria. Can I get you to weigh in on that uh, with an accent on what you believe to be the biggest misconception all these years later about partition? Well, I would agree with uh, Dr. Jalal that uh, one of the major misconceptions is that partition was inevitable. Uh, there was agency uh, in all the historical actors of that time, but there was another factor, and that was British strategic interests. The departing colonial empire saw uh, that its strategic interests lay in having a state um, carved from uh, within the colonial India, uh, which could uh, keep away the uh, Tsarist Russian Empire uh, from uh, coming south and also take care of British interests uh, in the Middle East. So that was also a driver uh, which was responsible for uh, partition ending up the way it did. Professor Mukherjee, is there any way to know, three quarters of a century later, whether the majority of public opinion was in favor of the solution that they ultimately came to? Well, it's a, it's a difficult question to, to sort of ask at the time of the event. But uh, even today, when you think about how individuals in India and Pakistan think about partition, uh, it's both a distant event, but something that's still very present in the politics of both countries. And I think Ambassador Hakani's point about how both countries' uh, politics have moved in a more nationalist direction has an impact on how partition is remembered. Uh, and whether it was, in a sense, a justified act, or whether it was it has been vindicated by history. Uh, I think individuals on both sides now feel that uh, the so-called two-nation theory that uh, that uh, Mohammed Jinnah Ali Jinnah had put forward that Hindus and Muslims needed two nations to to uh, coexist in in in, uh, in South Asia. Uh, there are significant chunks of the population in both sides in both countries now that feel that perhaps that was indeed uh, the right action for both countries to take. And what's your view on the issue of whether or not? It could have worked with everybody in one country. There, there were voices, obviously, that, that hoped for that, that believed that 75 years ago. What's your take on that? Well, um, I think Professor Jalal sort of hits the name on the head in the sense that when there is a struggle over political power, it's very difficult for these things to be resolved. Uh, I think Ambassador Bissari also pointed out the legacy of British colonialism. I think the way the British governed India uh, created certain divisions between communities uh, that uh, exacerbated pre-existing divisions in a way, um, and, and I think made it very difficult, almost, uh, I wouldn't want to say inevitable, but really loaded the dice in favor of, of uh, intercommunal uh, disharmony at the time of decolonization. 
Can I get no, you? I yeah, please. Disagree here because I do think that the ambassador's view that the British deliberately did this uh, is belied by historical evidence. They tried very hard with the cabinet mission plan uh, uh, to prevent a division. Uh, they even wanted to prevent a division of the Indian Army. Uh, so I do think that we need to bring in the internal uh, politics, uh, the differences between the two main political parties, uh, as the primary reason for the division. Uh, I agree that the British uh, used uh, the divide and rule to some extent to keep India whilst they uh, were uh, in power, but it made no sense necessarily uh, across the board for them to divide when they quit. And I think the evidence is overwhelming that they did bend over backwards to prevent it from happening, uh, and that it was just a disagreement, and it, was, it suited the Congress to divide rather than share power. Ambassador, do you want to come back on that? Uh, yes, uh, you know, I leave it to the historians to debate this issue, but uh, there is uh, uh, substantial historical evidence um, from British archives that also suggests that uh, the British had uh, this view that uh, it would be in their interest, uh, given that uh, the Congress party led by uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was not playing ball uh, enough uh, in, in terms of uh, aligning to British interests after the British would leave. So I think this is um, a historical debate that goes on, and I know uh, where Professor Jalal stands on it, and there are others uh, who cite uh, uh, British archival evidence to suggest that uh, British colonial interest was also a major factor. We should you hear can't share uh, to decide, you know, what people randomly say in documents. You need to have a policy. Uh, and if you can point me to that policy of the, of the British government, I'll be able to take this position more seriously. If I may come in at the moment, I would say that the historic argument is moot. Two nations exist. They have failed to get along for 75 years. Uh, and now what we should be looking at is the, the impact of partition on is an entire subcontinent. There was a second partition in 1971, uh, which was equally bloody. Uh, no partition is actually um, uh, uh, the solution of of any of, of coexistence issues. We saw the partition of Yugoslavia becoming bloody as well. So what happened in 1947 was ethnic cleansing in Punjab primarily, where now in the Indian Punjab, there are very few Muslims left. And in Pakistani Punjab, where there were a significant part of the population, there are no Hindus and Sikhs left. And that has really poisoned the well. Now on both sides, there are people who are the second generation, for example, people who are the children of people who went through their bloody partition, who have become the hardliners. And you see that pattern in both India and Pakistan, hardliners driving the issue and making it into more of a religious argument. So while I may agree with Dr. Jalal over what happened historically, I would say the, his, the consequences of that historic de development have been uh, far more significant in terms of creating two countries yes. that have failed to get along. It is no but longer you know, just... I can't agree on peace. why it happened. I, I really do think that that's really the fundamental problem, uh, that if you insist that this was it, ha partition happened because of religion, and now you're saying that religion because it gains more emphasis, I don't deny it. It's an ongoing process. But what's been forgotten um, uh, is the real issue, uh, which was the federal question. Uh, and if we continue to ignore it, we continue to ignore the current problem as well, where there's an attempt being made to use centralization to deny the federal demands that exist in the subcontinent. And so it is, I mean, how you frame partition, why it happened, is not just a moot question. It's how you understand the consequences of partition as well. Because what you do is when you emphasize religion, you ignore the political dimension, the regional dimension that was a major factor driving uh, the Dr. Jalal, you want to come back on that? party acts on the basis of religion, then religion does become the central question. How can you say that it just remains political because it's no, being pursued? Religion by... as what? Religion as, as, as identity, as difference, not religion as faith. I do think that they are, I mean, you're using religion rather loosely, uh, Ambassador. Uh, and I think that we are far ahead with that to understand what it really means. You need to understand what role religion played uh, in the partition of India, but to also account for the regional dimension that brought about the peculiarness of a partition India that was really the partition of Punjab and Bengal. 
Well, Professor Mukherjee, uh, to be sure, we are where we are today, and I wonder if we could look at the bilateral relationship of the two countries today, and in your judgment, what are the main points of conflict that exist today? Uh, thank you. Yes, I think uh, the status of Kashmir remains, of course, as, as you already pointed out, uh, a sort of significant pain point. Uh, uh, both countries have sort of fought wars over this uh, a number of times. Uh, there's also the issue, as, as India points out, of sort of terrorism that takes place um, in Kashmir, uh, which in India alleges sort of sp uh, sponsored by Pakistan, or at least uh, groups that have safe haven in Pakistan. Uh, there's the issue of nuclear weapons between the two countries. Uh, people have argued that that's a source of instability, although one might see that as also preventing both countries to, from escalating to higher levels of conflict. Uh, and finally, I think the presence of sort of external powers like the United States and China has, has deeply complicated uh, relations between the two countries on the subcontinent over the last six decades. Hi, Commissioner Basaria. Is there anything you'd add to that list? Uh, yes, so I would agree with uh, uh, what uh, Professor uh, Mukherjee said. Uh, terrorism certainly uh, is a major concern for India and a major deal breaker. The uh, territorial uh, argument about Jammu and Kashmir is another factor. There are also deeper uh, factors of identity and ideology, uh, with Pakistan seeing itself as the other of India. Uh, the uh, practical problem that India often faces in its uh, conversations with Pakistan is who do you speak to? So the civil-military tension in Pakistan is also a factor in the diplomacy in, in uh, who to address. And in many ways, the over-securitization of uh, Pakistan's polity is a factor for India where uh, Pakistan is seeing India as an existential threat. And uh, that, uh, that checks the discourse uh, and uh, makes it difficult to have those conversations. Ambassador Haqqani, can I get you to weigh in on what you see the main points of departure are today? The problem between India and Pakistan is more psychological than a political one right now. Uh, the Indian uh, government right now, led by the BJP, needs Pakistan as the other. Pakistan has consistently needed India as the other to build a national identity. The federal problem that Dr. Jalal referred to has not been resolved in Pakistan as well. And so to overcome that, religion has been emphasized much more, whether as identity or as faith. Uh, I personally am one of those who thinks that whenever religion is invoked, it is inevitable, whether it's as identity or pure faith, that the faith dimension will prevail, which is what has happened in the case of Pakistan. It has moved more and more towards identifying the faith elements of, the, uh, of what was essentially a Muslim, very loose Muslim identity at the time of partition. So Pakistan has had uh, that dimension. India is also having that process right now, makes talks very difficult. Terrorism continues to be a major factor. And on the Indian side, uh, the position is that unless that is resolved, we will not talk to Pakistan. So the two countries haven't had dialogue for several years, which makes it even more difficult to restart the dialogue in the near future. Professor Jalal, your view on this? Well, I mean, I think that the biggest stumbling block in Indo-Pakistan um, discussions and towards a resolution is the persistence of the colonial paradigm that both have embraced and have refused to move on. Uh, the paradigm I refer to is the idea of a monolithic, non-negotiable uh, sovereignty. Um, uh, and therefore, there can be no question of accommodating uh, regional aspirations without accusing them of secession. Uh, without uh, so, so I think that this colonial mentality and the persistence of that in the post-colonial state is really one of the major hurdles um, in the way of India and Pakistan moving ahead in a more creative way uh, that can accommodate their differences without necessarily undermining their mutual claims to sovereignty. Uh, you know, South Asia has a history of shared sovereignty. And um, uh, I mean, and, and, and what, what, what both countries have done is to not just embrace a British importation idea, and it's an idea, a discursive idea of a monolithic sovereignty, which even the British themselves for a while uh, gave away uh, with, with the EU. Uh, but I do think that it it's these ideas uh, and the inability uh, to move away from the colonial paradigm that I would say is the primary factor. Now, this relationship, of course, uh, not only existed in its own part of the world, but it was also caught up in a whole uh, subplot of uh, Cold War politics, uh, geopolitics, relations with uh, China, 
the Soviet Union slash Russia, the United States. Can I get you all to weigh in on what role you think all of that, all those external factors have played in the either worsening or occasionally improving relations between India and Pakistan. Uh, Hi, Commissioner Basaria, why don't you go first? Sure. I, I think the major powers have always had uh, a major influence on subcontinental politics. If you look at uh, 1971, when India and Pakistan had a major conflict, Pakistan uh, was used by the United States, by Nixon, for an outreach uh, to China. Um, and India at the same time signed in a friendship treaty with uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, today we see um, a, a reversal in uh, many of the geopolitical relationships. Uh, we see that uh, India has the U.S. and Russia as strategic partners, but sees Russia today, uh, sees China today as a, a strategic adversary. And uh, for Pakistan, I think the relationship with the U.S. and Ambassador Haqqani has written about it at length. Uh, has been a tumultuous one, but at this point, I think uh, Pakistan is trying to uh, balance its relationship with China and the U.S. With China, it has a relationship of excessive dependence, and uh, that uh, it feels uh, affects its uh, relationship uh, with the U.S. So the great powers matter, but I would make the point that uh, India and Pakistan, at the end of the day, have to solve their problems bilaterally. The great powers will not come, the major powers will not come and solve uh, India and Pakistan's uh, mutual um, bilateral issues. Uh, we will have to find ways and means of doing it ourselves. Why do you say that the great powers, uh, at the end of the day, will not be helpful enough to make progress? Well, to begin with, they often come with their own agendas. Uh, the second point is that both India and Pakistan have, uh, since 1971, tried various methods and then said that bilateralism is the way forward and we need to be talking to each other uh, to resolve these issues. And uh, this is uh, the position taken, for instance, uh, by the United States uh, that, uh, you know, they would like to get into this only if requested by both parties. And at this point of time, neither of the parties wants this. Gotcha. Uh, Professor Mukherjee, can I get you to weigh in on this issue of how the great powers have influenced this bilateral relationship over the years? Sure. I think there, there's a difference between what the great powers say and what they do. I think that uh, they say that this is a matter for bilateral resolution and that India and Pakistan should pursue their own policies. But by sort of being putting their finger on one or the other side of the scale throughout sort of the last few years, six, seven decades, they have, you know, of course, influenced the way India and Pakistan can approach each other. So, for example, the United States and China both have been, you know, Pakistan's allies for much of the Cold War, although the U.S. relationship was much more instrumental and fraught in, in some ways. Uh, the Soviet Union and India had a very close relationship, and India's relationship today with, China, with Russia remains very close based on a defense uh, uh, supply relationship. So, so long as the great powers are looking for arms markets and, and sort of, you know, places to to tip the geopolitical scale and, and gain influence against each other, these countries are now sort of the front line of U.S.-China competition as well. So it's difficult to see how this is not a, a, cause, of, a cause of some of the, the difficulties in resolving the relationship. Uh, um, Ambassador Haqqani, I'd be interested in your view, and I hope you don't think this is too chippy a question here, but when you were the ambassador of Pakistan to the United States, did you get the feeling that the American government genuinely cared about what happened in Pakistan, or did they genuinely care only in as much as Pakistan could be useful in their struggles against, say, China or the Soviet Union, whatever? I think that the Americans generally do care about the countries that they have relations with, uh, but that stops at the uh, point where their interests come into play. And so were there American interests relating to Pakistan at the time uh, because of the Afghan war? Definitely. Have those interests diminished significantly? Absolutely. But then the fact that Pakistan did not help uh, America in Afghanistan the way America expected and that we made promises that we did not keep, that has definitely put off the Americans, which is why the United States uh, no longer looks at Pakistan in the same way. But the fact 
remains that over the last 75 years, Pakistan's economic and military supply relationship with the United States has been very important for Pakistan. Pakistan would have had greater difficulty in maintaining the large military it inherited from the British if the Americans had not stepped in and helped. So the U.S. has poured money, it has poured weapons into Pakistan, and a lot of it has benefited the people of Pakistan. Like all such relationships, it is to the advantage of the Americans to do it, and that is the reason why they did it. They didn't do it out of just the love for the people of Pakistan. No country does that with any other country. So, so that, that, that reality does not offend you then? I think that that reality is a reality. And so, I mean, you can get offended as much as you like, but that reality is a reality. You 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 go to another country, you want economic support, uh, they always look at what is in it for them. And similarly, when it comes to military uh, supply relationships, that is always strategic. No one will arm a country unless and until they think that it is to their strategic advantage. Understood. Uh, Professor Jalal, I wonder if um, I wonder if I could get you to look at the other side of the coin, namely this so often fraught relationship between India and Pakistan. What kind of impact do you think that has had on the diasporas of both countries who live abroad and live so much of this as a part of their daily lives, even though they're a long way away from it? Well, I mean, I think the diaspora has a, a little bit more uh, options, uh, a few more options. I mean, culturally, they come together, but politically, they disagree. Uh, so if it's a, a conference on uh, uh, Kashmir, you can rest assured that the diaspora splits. But if it's a musical gathering, uh, the diaspora comes together. If it's a food gathering, they come together. So the diaspora is varied. But I, I would say that partition has, and uh, the separation and the hostilities between India and Pakistan have had a deep impact on the way in which um, uh, South Asian um, a di uh, I mean, diasporic population views itself. Uh, but I still would have to say that there is, there is a difference um, uh, uh, in, in terms of how, uh, uh, you know, things have changed over time. So if we look at the earlier period of the diaspora and now, I mean, in, you know, when you look at the, uh, 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 the, the early diasporic populations, they, they, they integrated, they worked together. Uh, and now I think the divisions get politicized a lot more because of India and Pakistan and their differences. Ambassador Basaria, I'd be interested in your take on this as the former High Commissioner from India to Canada. What did you see in terms of the diasporas when you were on duty here? Well, I would agree with Professor Jalal that, you know, the uh, culture often brings them together. But the polarized politics of back home, when they uh, transpose it to their new homes, uh, that divides them again. And uh, I think uh, there has been a recent trend of greater division, uh, given technology, given uh, mobility, given uh, social media. Uh, there has been a trend of uh, diasporas uh, becoming uh, more polarized, getting the divisive politics from back home. And I think that is a point of worry. Uh, if you are in Leicester or in Brampton, uh, you don't have the benefit of those borders to keep you from each other. Uh, and uh, we had an instance in the UK recently of uh, India-Pakistan cricket match turning into a bit of a riot. So I think this is something uh, we, we need to worry about. Often uh, we feel that diasporas are weaponized by state agencies and uh, they're used for protests. I used to have outside the Indian High Commission in Ottawa a large number of protests. You would have seen them in Toronto. Uh, we feel that these are uh, diasporas that are used by various state agencies to, uh, to create trouble. So I think uh, we need to watch uh, this trend. We need to be careful. And uh, we need to advise the diasporas uh, to live in greater harmony. Ambassador Haqqani, same question to you. When you had responsibilities for Pakistan in the United States, what impact did you see all of this playing on the community in the on the diaspora community in the US? The diaspora works very well in cultural settings. They eat at the same restaurants, they listen to the same music. Uh, but I agree that both sides have weaponized the diaspora and the political differences have become much more pronounced. And with the social media, it is very easy to rile people up. And both sides do that and not to the advantage of the diaspora, but to be able to build a narrative back home that the diaspora is active, 
and that will result in the great powers or the major powers where the diaspora is located taking sides. So it becomes political and the politics always divides. Hmm. All right, let me ask one last question and we'll go to uh, Drs. Mukherjee and Jalal on this one. Uh, can you imagine a future where these two countries are friends again? And if so, what will that take? Professor Mukherjee, start us off, please. Thank you. I think uh, those are two separate questions. I don't think I can imagine a future, which uh, to be pessimistic, uh, it's a very difficult future to imagine. But uh, I would say uh, if it were to happen, it would have to involve a settlement of the Kashmir issue. I think greater civilian control of the military in Pakistan uh, and also a, a different political dispensation in both places uh, in terms of nationalistic uh, outlooks on uh, on the other, as has been discussed. Uh, those are tall. That's a very tall order. So. And Professor Jalal. Well, I mean, I, I think I've already said so, that if they can uh, uh, stand out of the colonial paradigm and stop uh, seeing uh, each other uh, through that colonial paradigm, I think that there is a lot of possibility, uh, potentially. Uh, I agree that there is in the near future, given the politics of the two countries currently, uh, there is no chance of a breakthrough. Uh, but over a period of time, uh, and I think that can be facilitated if backroom uh, diplomacy continues, uh, and I uh, that leads to some people-to-people uh, -to -people interaction. Uh, a breakthrough is not on the cards. We need to basically get out of the colonial way of treating each other. And I think that's a very large question, which I can't completely ad address. Uh, but I have pointed to one, which is a sovereignty. Uh, the other is the view that anyone who asserts uh, a regional demand is necessarily a secessionist. Uh, so I really think that we have bought into the colonial way of thinking so much that we have lost the ability to think what is in our own best interest. And if we can do that, I still think that over a period of years, we could uh, potentially uh, avoid the frightful water wars that are hovering on the horizon. And without uh, some measure of international uh, nudging, uh, are unlikely to be resolved. Uh, so that's what I would say. And let's get the two ambassadors on this as well. Ambassador Basaria, can these countries become friends again? And if so, how does it happen? Well, I, I think that's the uh, title of a book by Ambassador Hakani. So he uh, should give you a detailed menu. But, you know, I would uh, uh, say that there are three or four things we could do. Uh, firstly, it's important to bridge this uh, deficit of trust. I think the first thing to be done is to stop terrorism. That, from India's point of view, is very important. That's a deal breaker. Uh, and uh, that can be done by the military establishment itself and without uh, the civilians uh, being involved. Secondly, I think it's important to give diplomacy a chance. Uh, I was expelled uh, when I was high commissioner in Pakistan in uh, August uh, 2019. And since then, we haven't had high commissioners. You need senior diplomats to have those conversations, to do some creative diplomacy, to get to a spot where we can uh, look at the modus vivendi of our forward movement. And I think, thirdly, it's important to be pragmatic, uh, because it's important to remember that India had a relationship uh, which was troubled also with Bangladesh, which was uh, the former Eastern Pakistan. And that relationship has improved dramatically. We've managed land, water, river agreements. We do trade. We have $18 billion of trade. So um, that stands as a model of what can be done uh, from the partitioned eastern wing of Pakistan. Uh, we already have a great relationship. And I think it's feasible, it's possible, and we need to keep working at it. Last word to Ambassador Haqqani. In 1947, the founder of Pakistan, Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, in an interview with Canadian radio, said that he looks forward to a relationship between Pakistan and India that would be more like the relationship between Canada and the United States. And what is the relationship between Canada and the United States? Uh, there are not, it is not that they don't have outstanding issues, but they do not make them the basis of uh, military action. Uh, they have a relatively open border. Uh, they allow their people to go into each other's countries quite easily. And uh, they have a huge trade 
relationship. If Pakistan and India can work towards that and understand that those have to be the priorities rather than the issues that divide them, then they can definitely move forward into having a more positive relationship. Diplomacy is definitely needed, expelling each other's uh, high commissioners and not having major uh, diplomatic uh, processes going uh, ongoing is not a recipe for positive relations. And certainly, if Canada had been sending terrorists into the uh, uh, into uh, the U.S. or U.S. had terrorists going into Canada, that would not have been uh, very conducive to positive relations between these two North American neighbors. They are, that is not conducive to relations in South Asia as well. Ken, I thank the four of you for spending so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Ambassadors Basaria and Hakani, Professors Mukherjee and Jalal, it was great to have you on TVO. Thank you so much for sharing your, your views with us in this 75th anniversary year of the partition of India and Pakistan. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Forecasts suggest that China's economic growth for 2022 will come in at slightly more than 3%. That might sound good, but compared to the recent past, where 8% or more was the norm, it's becoming clear that China's economy has hit a rough patch. How rough and for how long? Let's find out from Mary Lovely. She's an economist and senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, who joins us from Washington, D.C., and in Vancouver, British Columbia, Joanna Chu, senior reporter at the Toronto Star and author of China Unbound, A New World Disorder. And Joanna, it's good to have you back on our program. We had you on when your book came out. Mary Lovely, it's great to meet you and appreciate you making time for us. Joanna, to you first, we see that China has delayed the release of its latest economic growth figures. They were supposed to be published as the leadership gathered at the party congress to confer a third term on President Xi Jinping. What do you infer from this? Mm -hmm. As you know, Steve, I was a journalist in Beijing for seven years. I was actually last there five years ago when Xi Jinping got the mandate to rule for life, which is very likely why he will get a third term this weekend. But as a journalist in Beijing, one of your earliest days, working days of the year, is the start of the party congress when they release the GDP figures. You line up at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. to race to be the first media outlet to release those figures. So it's really, really unusual that they have postponed indefinitely the release of these figures. It's pretty unprecedented, and it really shows and may, really makes it seem that the figures are worse than economists even predicted. You mentioned growth of 3%, which is um, you know, quite low compared to previous years, previous decades in China. But now with the postponement, uh, economists are wondering if the growth is even lower than that. Uh, China's unemployment rate is you know, getting higher and higher. And I think a lot of people living in China, companies, consumers, are really like the confidence in China's economy has really taken a nosedive. Barry, can you just add to that in as much as I think our viewers and listeners would like to know some of the background that would be contributing to China's economic difficulties at the moment? Help us with that. Well, in the short term, the two biggest factors are the zero COVID policy, the lockdowns, the fear of lockdowns that have led consumer confidence to really take a nosedive and has slowed consumer spending. So in the second quarter of this year, actually, consumer spending um, shrunk a little bit. So growth was very low, but it was made up of two other factors. So um, that's an important. Another important factor is, of course, the ongoing property crisis. Uh, Chinese households have a lot of their money invested in the property sector. And when the property prices decline, as they has been, that lowers household wealth, lowers consumption, provides another downward pressure on the economy. Joanna, if I can use a terrible pun here, let's just zero in on the zero COVID policy for a mm -hmm. second. Tell us what this actually looks like on the ground, the zero COVID mm -hmm. policy. Yeah, so I haven't lived in China for five years, but have been in touch with close friends uh, who live in China, who were living in Shanghai when we, they had that infamous, really harsh lockdown from April to June. 
I have friends who lost 10 kilograms because food was so limited during this really quick, sudden lockdown when there were some COVID cases in this, you know, very, very big and cosmopolitan city. And I think there was already rising um, frustration among people in China about uh, President Xi's zero COVID policy, you know, not being able to travel since the pandemic started, really, really quite lengthy mandatory quarantine, which has really affected global business relations between Chinese and international companies. But I think Shanghai was kind of the last straw. It was very symbolic to this, you know, relatively um, progressive city uh, and outward looking city in China just locking down overnight. Um, so it's actually triggered this movement called uh, the run movement in China, where especially young people feel that they don't have much of a future staying in China. They're really um, trying to leave their homes. They want to go to places. And I have met people who have left and are now living in Vancouver. Um, so, you know, people actually picking up and leaving China, I think it's a very good indication of how zero COVID has really shaken people's confidence, not just in how China's economy might be able to recover from this, but also just the future. I think there's growing dissatisfaction with the authoritarianism from Beijing's government, the crackdown in all sorts of human rights and areas. Yeah, Mary, let me follow up with you on the zero COVID policy as well. Do you think uh, Xi Jinping... Uh, is going to reconsider the advisability of following this zero COVID policy as tightly as he has, given what everybody anticipates to be the negative, negative economic news to come out. Well, I certainly agree with Joanna that this has been a turning point and an eye opener for a lot of companies and individuals. Uh, Xi Jinping has given us no reason to believe that this policy is going to change anytime soon. He's a bit backed into a corner. Um, he has trumpeted uh, China's success in avoiding uh, many COVID deaths. Um, and if he removes zero COVID na policy now, um, it's unclear what will happen. China has many old people. It has, it's been vaccinated with its homegrown vaccines. We don't know how effective they'll be against the Omicron variant. And so he risks widespread suffering and illness. And that's just simply unacceptable to him. Let me do a follow-up with you, Mary, on the issue of the war in Ukraine and what impact you think that is having on China's economy at the moment. I think it's had both negative and positive effects. I think in some sense it has eased uh, energy prices. China has begun to import a lot of oil from Russia. Um, it was already getting energy from Russia, but this has lowered the price for them. Uh, some of that has been resold, uh, particularly to India. Um, it has, uh, however, also, I think, um, strengthened the resolve in the West to see China as an adversary, uh, more so than a competitor. And we've seen that by the recent actions in the United States to uh, extend export controls on semiconductors and semi semiconductor equipment manufacturing. Manufacturing equipment, sorry. Mm -hmm. Let me do a quote here uh, from President Xi Jinping. And Joanne, I'll get you to pick up on this. Uh, in a speech to the Communist Party's Congress in 2017, so we're going back five years here, uh, he said, China will not close its door to the world. We will only become more and more open. Well, okay, he didn't anticipate COVID, in fairness to him, but clearly this hasn't happened. So how detrimental do you see the continued isolationism uh, due to the zero COVID policy? Mm -hmm. I was just in Taiwan last month to try to see at least closer to the ground what's happening. And people talk about Taiwan because uh, that's where the world's biggest semiconductor microchip foundries are. Uh, TSMC is the biggest. And China relies on TSMC. The U.S. relies on TSMC. What's happening now is really interesting because we see kind of a closing up on both sides, China with its zero COVID policies and also the U.S. with the export controls. Um, the U.S. has really, really, um, those export controls are very stringent, really targeting and trying to strangle China's ability to uh, innovate in AI and high tech. Uh, which are, you know, the future technologies that will transform uh, China cities. That's what they're hoping. They want smart cities. They want smart cars everywhere. So on both sides from the U.S. and also China's policies, what we're seeing, I and I fear, is kind of a bifurcating of the world. So countries like Canada will have to choose 
Uh, are you going to want to keep working with China or do you want to be able to keep doing business with the U.S., especially in certain fields that are considered sensitive, um, like technology? So a lot of countries are trying to diversify at least to mediate some of the risk um, to move some of its manufacturing away from China, maybe not entirely, but at least spreading it around Vietnam, Indonesia, Taiwan. So actually, uh, people are pushing for Canada to kind of catch up with like-minded countries to release some sort of strategy on how it will mitigate um, this really complex factors, including U.S.-China competition, uh, including ongoing zero COVID. Um, and uh, Foreign Minister Jolie has said that after this week's party Congress, they will release Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which has been long delayed. So hopefully we'll see what Canada's plan is exactly to deal with these this really, really difficult terrain. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick up on the Canada angle a little bit more in a second, but I first want to hear from Mary on, uh, on your views, Mary, uh, as it relates to increasing isolationism in China and the implications on their economy thereof? Well, we have to remember that China did liberalize um, its financial services sector. So there was a lot of the flow of U.S. investment into this sector recently. Um, in the last couple of years, it's also received record amounts of inward foreign direct investment. So what Joanna is talking about and I'm talking about are things that are happening right now. We don't know what the extent of this bifurcation will be. Uh, many of us have been talking about worries uh, about um, splitting the echo uh, system that supports innovation, uh, particularly semiconductors. And we're seeing that happen right now in real time. Part of the U.S. export controls um, demand that any U.S. passport holders, U.S. citizens, uh, cannot work for certain uh, companies in China that make semiconductors or semiconductor manufacturing equipment. So there are very high level people inside China who um, have these passports, are Chinese, um, and are going to have to decide. So this is really the beginning of a splitting of the ecosystem, a dividing up of the talent. And we don't know how this will affect the industry uh, moving forward. Um, will the industry be as innovative and vibrant if it's two instead of one? Because many of these technologies rely on really a global pool of talent and a global pool of knowledge uh, to make the progress that we have made so far. Joanna, let's pursue that Canadian angle a little more now. And I'll start with the fact that uh, I think I saw the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of the country, Chrystia Freeland, say the other day that Canada really needs to start looking towards creating more links both economically, socially, culturally, uh, in business, of course, uh, with other like-minded nations, and perhaps, I don't, know how, I don't know how strongly she was pushing this idea, but distancing themselves from countries that were inc increasingly bellicose on the world stage. Certainly she thought mm -hmm. of Russia first, but China uh, was likely in there as well. So, okay, this increasingly isolationist China because of the COVID policies, the presumably adverse uh, economic numbers that are still to come out, how do you see all that affecting Canada? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, this is obvious for all of your viewers, but also has to be said that I think Canada has learned a lesson from the whole Meng Wanzhou and Two Michaels crisis that, you know, detaining Meng on the behest of U.S. authorities, as, you know, Canada had the obligation to do so, um, led to the hostage taking of Canadians. And that has been at the forefront of Canada's uh, foreign relations with China for, you know, much of the last few years, trying to uh, secure the release and the safety of these Canadian men that were caught up. Um, in addition to the hostage taking, China also used, increasingly uses, my, my book looks at its economic coercion measures around the world, using tariffs, um, uh, blocking uh, imports of certain goods from countries that it has uh, conflict with. Australia is a, kind of a major um, there's a major dynamic there with many Australian goods blocked. So I think Canada sees what's happened to ourselves and also sees what the pattern of what China's doing around the world, uh, kind of resorting to kind of um, more of these aggressive tactics to try to get what it wants. Um, so it makes sense, a lot of experts say it makes sense for Canada and other countries to try to at least diversify uh, its global markets and investments. It, it just seems wise because China has been dangling, uh, holding hostage both 
citizens of the world and also different economies and industries of the world. Uh, farmers are often people who suffer when things like canola or pork, uh, you know, or get slapped with tariffs. Um, but that said, um, you know, talking about global talent pool, there is some silver lining here in that there are still many, many Chinese scientists, scholars who are able to study overseas, to work overseas. Um, there aren't regulations and rules that bar most of them from contributing to global innovations. And I think that's what we have to uh, keep in mind that as we deal with an increasingly aggressive Beijing, um, we're not isolated from China in that the people are different from the Chinese government. And they are keen, like I said, to leave the country, to build their lives elsewhere. Um, and we can still benefit from uh, their talent. Uh, just the talent pool in China is huge. So I would also, you know, caution that people shouldn't give up on all people of China and actually to welcome them coming and working in our universities, trying to contribute to fields like medicine and science. No, oh, that's a great distinction to make. A very good point. Uh, Mary, let's get the American angle into this now. Uh, there have been a lot of predictions recent predictions suggesting that China, because of its massive growth rates over the past many years, would overtake the United States in the not too distant future as the world's biggest economy. Uh, do, do you think that project is on hold for now? I think it's delayed. Um, we are seeing a much, uh, we're going to see slower growth in China this year. Even next year, the predictions are a little over 4% and you know, those are just predictions. If zero COVID policy continues into next year, um, it's going to be hard even to reach those numbers. So there's a lot of uh, ifs up in the air. Um, and it depends on how we look at the uh, economy. If we look at it in dollar terms, uh, that's a little more difficult because the RMB has depreciated against the dollar. If we look at it in sort of purchasing power parity terms, uh, China will eventually, I think, over overtake the United States, but it's going to be at a much slower rate than was previously predicted. Hmm. Let's also now just uh, understand what slower growth rates in China will mean in terms of Xi Jinping's uh, mission for the country and his hopes for what the country might have become uh, if the law, if the um, you know eight and nine percent growth rates were able to continue. Uh, Joanna, a slowing Chinese economy means what has to be put on hold in terms of China Inc. as a project. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's what we see now is that we perhaps are seeing bigger human rights crackdowns. The pattern I witnessed firsthand living in China is as the Chinese leadership feels like its grip on power is, um, you know, loosening, that they crack down harder on any type of criticism, even if it's constructive criticism from people like lawyers or um, political scientists in China who are trying to advocate for better checks and balances uh, to fight issues like corruption in government. These people, many of them are in jail in Hong Kong, many uh, law, previous lawmakers uh, are in jail uh, under the national security law. Um, so in the short term, uh, perhaps long term, you will see uh, a insecure leadership cracking down harder on its people, also its critics around the world. Uh, we saw in Manchester in the UK, uh, some, you know, Hong Kong diaspora immigrant protesters were outside the Chinese uh, consulate and um, police authorities there said one of them was dragged in and beaten up on consulate grounds and had to be rescued from by UK police. So, you know, these scenes are alarming and unfortunately I think I see them uh, ramping up. I see foreign journalists, foreign researchers uh, continue the trend of being kicked out of China uh, in a quite aggressive terms. So we are losing our ability to really understand firsthand what's going on in the country when this kind of insecure state is doesn't want people to see. So they're pushing out uh, journalists, researchers. Um, so all in all, I think this is not going to be this high insecurity isn't good for China's society. It's not good for, like we said, consumer business confidence uh, in investing in China, in making large purchases and traveling when travel is perhaps in the future going to be more accessible. 
So let me it, just jump in, really Joanna, because I'm running out of time and I want to make sure I get Mary on this as well. Mm -hmm. Mary, tell us, uh, OK, so political instability, social instability, we're hearing from Joanna. What do you see uh, in the future as a result of the slowing growth rates in the country? Well, just looking at Xi Jinping's economic agenda, um, with slower growth, he's going to have trouble reaching some of the key uh, objectives of his uh, next five years, one of which is common prosperity. He's stressed employment in his recent work report to the party Congress. Um, it's hard to get employment growth when productivity is low, um, when the economy isn't able to grow quickly because of a variety of factors, such as misallocation of capital, you know, privileging state enterprises over private sector businesses. So he's going to have trouble delivering on the key uh, economic goals that he's set. Um, and that certainly interacts with the kind of political repression that Joanne is talking about. Because to maintain stability, they'll have to rely more on these other tools uh, than on growth. So it's, um, it's a dynamic that we'll certainly want to watch moving forward. And what do you think uh, Xi Jinping can do to uh, stem the tide of what you've just forecast? I think there's a lot of reforms that have been out there that they know very well, uh, making sure that private sector businesses have the capital that they need. For example, the entry of new businesses is really slowed. That means they're not getting the capital they need to grow. Venture capital money into the country has really slowed. Um, things like providing a better social safety net for people uh, who will then allow them to reduce their saving, consume more, move to more consu consumption-led growth. So there's a whole bunch of policies that are out there. Unfortunately, they would require more decentralization, less control from the center, and therefore it seems unlikely that Xi Jinping will adopt these needed reforms. Joanna, last minute to you on that. Can mm -hmm. you imagine the loosening from the center to allow these reforms to happen? Um, the macro reforms, I'm not sure, but I think on, on zero COVID, which is a major factor for the economy slowdown, there are ways I think um, the CCP can gradually adjust its policies to not, you know, overnight, because I think it, it is hospitals would be overwhelmed. They would see a lot of uh, COVID deaths. But I think what's necessary perhaps to, you know, pr reduce this complete just uh, shutdown of consumer confidence is to at least gradually uh, reduce some of the COVID measures. Gotcha. Great summary, you two. Thank you very much. Joanna Chu from the Toronto Star, Mary Lovely from the Peterson Institute. We thank you for joining us from Vancouver and Washington, respectively. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. Research in several long-standing Western democracies, including our own, is detecting a troubling trend among young people, a growing cohort drawn to authoritarian politics. Tomorrow, we'll look into why. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.